welcome everyone uh, to our first panel. It's an amazing panel, uh, probably the most Im important topic um, in, in recent history, uh, the emergence of AI and, and generative AI language uh, models and what it means to our industry, what it means to the country. And as we establish a, a Center for Public Policy and Responsibility through Encompass's 501c3 Foundation, what we hope to do is to bring thought leaders together, um, and probably there's no more impressive group of thought leaders than, than what we have on, on stage. Milo Medin, uh, who brought us, um, helped lead first Google Fiber and, and Google Wireless, and uh, has a tremendous background in the industry, continues as a, as a what should I say, a startup, an engineer? A, a, no comment. Yes, <laughs> and all of the above. Uh, Mignon Clyburn, uh, former FCC uh, chairwoman, uh, commissioner, South Carolina uh, commissioner, uh, just a tremendous friend. For a competition, uh, has worked in advisory roles with the Department of Defense as it relates to AI and cybersecurity but from a government uh, leader and one with experience and one who can speak for communities and, and, and uh, organizations around the country. We're very uh, pleased to have Mignon Clyburn both work with us in Compass and as uh, an advisor on the board. Then, I, um, you know, I used to say uh, Colin uh, was a, a friend now, an old friend, uh, a longtime friend uh, who worked for our uh, now Senator Markey, but then Congressman Markey. In the early days of the, the formation of policies that brought us competition and cable and satellite and wireless, the 1996 Telecommunications Act, the early internet policy, the net neutrality uh, work uh, at the FCC. And then he went on to establish uh, the government uh, affairs offices for Twitter, not only in the United States and Washington, but around the world. And now heads up uh, a, a wise group called the Blue Owl uh, uh, Group. And so we're very uh, pleased to have uh, Colin, his, his long, thoughtful policy uh, advice, leadership guidance. And then uh, Sana uh, Sheik, Sheik from uh, Granite Telecommunications, who can tell us from the industry and who is serving both government and uh, commercial enterprises around the country. Uh, if, you, if you think of Walmart, Walgreen, every post office, CVS, Burger King, uh, the retail multi-location market, uh, granite touches almost everything everywhere. And so we're very pr pleased and proud to have uh, everyone on this panel as we talk about uh, AI and how we should approach it. What are the enduring principles to this new tech, uh, new application and technology that is coming uh, across the country. And so I'm going to, uh, Milo, I don't know if uh, we'll, we'll kind of start with you and go down the, the list. Um, any key issues that, uh, that you want to point out or principles of how we should approach AI from a, a public policy, from a industry best practices, and what are the big issues that you see coming ahead? Um, well, that was a really specific question. Yes. <laughs> um, I think, you know, uh, I'm old. Uh, I, I remember working on Internet technology back in the, in the days before the web. And uh, in those days, you had to know a lot about the network in order to use it, right? We, we moved files. We had email. It was before the domain name system, et cetera. And then the browser showed up. And the browser made it really easy to use the internet without having to know about it. Um, these large, AI has been around for a long time. Certainly in my old company, virtually every product that Google make, made, made has AI in it. But these large language models that are out right now have now made it easy to use AI without having to be a TensorFlow programmer or a, PyTorch engineer, et cetera. And I think you're going to see a whole set of changes where you're going to have people enabled 
by these kind of tools to do things that only experts could do before. And uh, given this is in Compass and about competition, uh, it's really going to bring a lot more competition into the space. So photographers, for example, uh, who go out and do shoots for commercial clients, right? They want a picture of a certain set of things. Well, you're now going to have a whole set of people competing for that business who never use a camera. Um, at Google, there were the, some of the best engineers uh, in terms of power management and data science. And then they came out with a AI model that not only matched but exceeded that performance. And so you don't, now you don't necessarily, Check you're out not, these pictures. Right. <laughs> yeah. uh, my uh, pixel I, again. Uh, <laughs> but now you end up with this leveling where companies don't necessarily have to go have the elite engineers anymore uh, because you've got these new tools that bring you in a competitive range. So I think there's a great opportunity for uh, people to upskill their um, what they work on and improve productivity and for companies uh, to compete in a more aggressive way. Mignon, as, as you think about what are the guardrails and public policy and concerns that you might have or the the great benefits and opportunities that you see? Well, good morning, uh, everyone. Um, I've got, uh, as you can tell, um, do hardware, software, or, um, uh, so forgive me for limping in. Um, but I think it, it, it's somehow symbolic that I'm limping in. Um, and, and I say that because, and I'm going to uh, take some liberties with uh, your question if you, you will allow me to. Because when I think about this panel today, I cannot help uh, but think about what I um, had been doing for om almost 20 years of my life, and that's regulation. And when we talk about efficiencies and accuracies and innovation, and when we talk about AI, how does that become ubiquitous or, or a standard inside of government um, from a regulatory perspective? I mean, what are we going to see there? How can we keep up? You know, when I, when I came in, um, you know, in regulation in 98, uh, it seemed very analog, very um, analog. And even then, we were speaking about, you know, how we move forward and, and, and how we uh, keep up with you guys in terms of innovation. Now that is, I can't even, uh, I hate to say on steroids, I'm not. Um, um, but now, I mean, it, it's just so widespread. Um, and it, it, it's so much, uh, it's more of a challenge. So um, if I can take a, a few liberties of, you know, with your uh, underlying question, really how does government keep up and how does government leverage technology itself? How do we better adopt it when it comes to decision making? You know, how, how do we uh, better leverage to keep up with you guys? Um, all of those things are, are, are really a, a, important. And so as we continue to talk, and maybe I'll answer your question later, I really wanted, um, you know, the, the, uh, you know, to set the stage there because I really think, um, you know, government in and of itself cannot divorce itself, um, not only from keeping up with you, but how you guys process and how this AI evolution should become internal and embedded uh, within us. Nick, uh, Colin, I'm, I'm, is, is I think through your role and the early legislation for competitive policy across every network and platform, uh, and then the early policy formation on the commercial internet. Are there enduring principles that you can apply to AI that uh, could be insightful uh, to the audience today and as we establish the center that could guide us in our work? Sure, um, and thank you for uh, the invitation. It's a delight to be on this panel with uh, fellow panelists. And um, <clears throat> happy Super Tuesday to those celebrating. Um, uh, I was just reflecting on what Milo was saying about sort of the early uh, internet days. And uh, one of the things that I keep coming back to when I think about AI as a revolutionary technology from a consumer standpoint uh, is that oftentimes those revolutionary technologies uh, bring uh, uh, some enthusiasm, um, some trepidation, some anxiety, 
Uh, and I was remembering that when I was a young puppy staffer on Capitol Hill in 1991, Phil Zimmerman released PGP encryption onto a Usenet group, and then it quickly found itself into the nascent and growing internet. So PGP stood for pretty good privacy. <laughs> but what it did is it made encryption, end-to-end -end encryption, strong encryption, readily available to people who might not otherwise get it. However, in 1991, encryption was treated under regulation as a munition. It was treated like rocket launchers or grenades, and you needed an export license to uh, push commercial encryption outside of the United States. And so by 1993, Phil Zimmerman found himself under a federal investigation uh, for violating export controls. And when that PGP uh, upload occurred of that strong encryption, <laughs> law enforcement, the intelligence community, and a variety of other players in, in uh, uh, you know, policymaking circles were very, very concerned. Why? Because with that technology, terrorists could use it, organized crime syndicates could use it, child predators. And so there was a parade of horribles that could flow from that. Now, Congress decided ultimately not to break encryption and to uh, dumb it down, so to speak. But Congress took note of the concerns in 1994, passed the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, which gave access to digital uh, communications under valid law enforcement uh, requests. Uh, because of unbreakable encryption arriving, Congress had to enact the Digital Millennium Copyright Act in 1998 and talk about the affirmative defenses that would go to uh, digital rights management uh, that included uh, strong encryption. So Congress responded and helped to create a framework, not through one omnibus law, but through a series of laws. And when I look at uh, the fact that ChatGPT was launched into the wild, and you see the reactions once again from law enforcement and the intelligence community and others, and there is a parade of horribles that could, that could spin out of that, that are non-trivial. Uh, you know, the, 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 the world is new again. And so there is a, an element of what we're seeing in policymaking debates right now where uh, a new framework may be needed. Issues that had been settled for the previous era will need to be revisited, including copyright, licensing, including concerns about national security. But as with any technology and the values you asked about, Chip, the values we care about, the human values that should animate technology, are immutable. So even as the technology changes, you know, the core values of the underlying Communications Act, diversity, localism, universal service, as augmented in the Telecom Act of 1996 by adding values of competition and uh, an embrace of innovation and global markets, those values we retain even as the technology changes. But we have to come up with a framework that embraces the benefits of the new technology while being open-eyed, as I said, to the non-trivial downside consequences as well, and build in protections for that as best we can. Okay. Son of, no one is, like Granted, is probably more connected to a wide diversity of businesses around the country. Um, as you talk to your customers, what are the applications and the services and the benefits and the network optimization that, that you think will be important with AI. You know, Rob Hale, the CEO of Granite, one of the leading philanthropists in the country, cares deeply about cancer and cancer research. One of our advisors that uh, is joining the Encompass uh, Center is uh, Dr. Uh, Bobby Robbins, who is the current president of the University of Arizona, but was the past president and CEO of the largest cancer uh, research center in the world at the uh, Texas Medical Center, MD Anderson. And so we have tremendous benefits that I, I think, you know, from a granted perspective, both about what you care about philanthropically and in health research, but your business customers. 
So tell me what you're hearing and what you think AI means to your customers. Um, first off, thank you so much, Chris, for having me. Thank you for having me. Good morning to all of you and as well as my fellow panelists. I'm really excited to be on this panel with. Um, with regard to Granite telecommunications, I want to start by kind of giving a little bit of background about what exactly it is that Granite does. So Granite started several years ago as a competitive local exchange carrier, kind of really aggregating phone lines, odd lines our customers. And what we really have focused on is listening to our customers. Over time, our customers came and they said, hey, what about access services? Can you also do our ag uh, aggregation for access? We listen. The foundation of Granite has always been a customer focus. And what our customer is asking us for now is real-time information at their fingertips. They want data-driven information to be available to them so they can make strategic information, strategic decisions about their network, about their infrastructure, about their security. And so where that really leads us in a few places. One, our customers are really excited about AI, both from the back end about what that means to us, about what, how we're kind of really using automation to enable efficiencies across our operations. On one end, that's across network operations. The amount, vast amount of data that our customers have can be all we're able to use AI to organize it in one platform and be able to receive that information, predictive analysis, to be able to tell our customers, hey, this is the thing going on with this network, real time support is very easy to use and to make those decisions. That's all happening on the back end. We're also using automation to really enhance our provisioning, enhance our troubleshooting, enhance our configuration, all to kind of really minimize human error. So our customers are getting a better experience. On the flip side, our customers seeing us on our back end, they want to know what this means for them on the front end. So one of the things that we're really working on and we're really excited about is a new platform called Granite 360, which really is using AI to provide our customers with all the information that they need at their fingertips to make decisions in real time and quickly. Instead of having to reach out, wait for a response, and then look at all the data, especially in our case when we have customers have locations across the United States, they don't want that raw data. Some, some of them do. Some of them do want that raw data sent to them so they can see for themselves and they can make that analysis. But what they're really looking for is a platform that's leveraged in AI, that's leveraged in technology, provide them with the solution. And all this AI technology to be able to organize the data that way is giving us the ability to provide our customers with the utmost best customer um, experience, but also to help them drive the best customer solution for their high location. So our customers are excited about it. We're listening to our customers. We've always been customer driven. Now we've got customers that can use it on the AI side and use other technology as well. Uh, right. and, and Chip, you know, may I leave you with two words for today? Yes. Um, I usually do one word, um, but there's two words today. Avoid regrets. What we want to do is re avoid regrets. We want to put up, as you mentioned, other necessary guardrails as regulators and as um, you know, uh, business owners. But what we don't want to do is come back and say, I wish I could have, should have, would have. No. Um, and, and at the end of the day, it's going to take some collective, um, you know, community to do that, um, a, a, a vision, you know, to recognize that we really do not want to do, you know, we want to do no harm. Uh, you know, what we want to enable, um, we want to leverage um, innovation. Um, but if um, a significant vulnerable sector of our population um, is harmed by all of this, we're going to have problems in the long term. And so avoiding regrets, um, I, I think, is what I want to leave with you. This per sort of answers the question to you. you had, yeah, go ahead, Mala. Yeah, please add. Um, I guess I'm not suggesting that all guardrails are bad, mm -hmm. but depending on guardrails to prevent bad things from happening with information, probably not a wise strategy. And what I mean by that is betting on ignorance, which is what you're doing by saying, we're gonna try and prevent the rules from giving people information that could be used in bad ways, mm -hmm. um, sometimes can cause people to not think through what happens if those tools are actually out there. In other words, uh, I don't think that you can depend on guardrails to prevent the bad things from happening. 
they will knowledge from the beginning the internet has really taken data that used to be in the hands of few and making it available to many many people and so that data could be has been used for all sorts of good it's also been used to do some bad things ai is going to be the same way the other thing i think that guardrails sometimes can do is cause the researchers to feel like they don't have to have quite so much responsibility about the products they put out. Because after all, it will be the government who will put in. Uh, so you think, you think guardrails will create that part of it in terms I of think, that? I think guardrails, so I give you a. I'm, a I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not done. Now this is actually, this is very good. This will show you what we're gonna be doing in the years to come, yeah. uh, resolving and res uh, uh, all the tensions that are in really a transformational technology. During the, during the Maven um, uh, controversy at Google, I remember having this conversation with a senior leader. And he said, well, the reason why the researchers are so upset about this is they feel like physicists in the, in the, in the 40s and 50s. They didn't want their work being used for nuclear weapons. And I uh, said, well, I actually worked on nuclear weapons at Livermore when I was in in uh, school at Cal, and uh, we never open sourced a warhead design. Like, yeah. you know, if it's one thing to say, we are going to publish everything, make everything available, uh, and then it's, it's up to the government to prevent bad things from being done with that information. I just don't think government can do that. And, uh, and so that's that's what I mean. Okay, and I, and I guess and finally learned how to use a mic. Sorry, um, uh, you know, and, and I guess my definition and how I interpret you know that term in terms of guardrails is, is is more of a check and balance. It's more of every one of us, including government, under you know understanding what their role is. Um, what their responsibilities are, um, and that this is not a, a responsibility-free zone. And right. if we all recognize that, and, and then uh, it, it's not inhibiting, it's not um, you know, tampering uh, competition, it, it's enabling it in a responsible way. And, you can tell we know, we know yeah, each other. Yeah. Yeah. Colin? Uh, yeah, I would also say <clears throat> we don't need laws for good ethical people. We pass laws for the people who are going to uh, cross ethical lines, who are um, attempted uh, too greatly uh, to do so, perhaps. And so oftentimes those guardrails are there not for the 90-some percent of the people who will go about their daily lives or their commercial lives and uphold ethical values. It's there for those who might transgress them. The second reason why um, there are guardrails sometimes is to deal with intra-industry um, relationships. And those guardrails are competitive guardrails. They're guardrails that, uh, that compel openness uh, and opportunities for greater competition, greater consumer choice. And so the irony is sometimes you need uh, regulation uh, to enhance competition. And that's, that's, a, that's an irony, uh, but it's uh, quite often true. Now, as, as we have this conversation, Encompass's history, you know, we were the first in 1981 to advocate for competition in telecommunications and the then nascent long distance uh, industry, which became the internet backbone uh, of our networks. And it was under the principle of open networks, is, the interconnection of networks. As we got into the internet age, it was an open, uh, an open internet because that openness, the, the access of anyone to content everywhere and commercial enterprises from small to large to have access to a worldwide market with equal reciprocity and, and equal access, that open internet uh, principle was something Encompass advocated. And now as we get to, to AI, how can we have the most open AI, the most competitive AI, with the safety and the responsibility of, of that, that we can try to create? And 
And why is Encompass uniquely positioned for this discussion or debate or to make recommendations to policymakers? And that, you know, our membership is fairly unique in Washington. We have the leading technology companies that have been on the forefront of developing the generative AI models, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, uh, Meta. Uh, and we have all of the competitive infrastructure, the digital infrastructure from data centers to national fiber, to national uh, tower, to 5G, to satellite, to fixed wireless, to local fiber. The ecosystem, we have everything in the ecosystem of the infrastructure and the applications and the content to kind of know the critical infrastructure. How do we protect and secure the, that aspect of what will be deployed and, and the applications that will, will come to every user of our networks and enabled by the networks, the advanced applications of AI that will be uh, enabled by the networks. But those who are creating these both wonderful, sometimes scary uh, to us applications. So I think we're uniquely uh, positioned. We want to work with uh, regional hubs of, of universities, whether it's my, my alma mater, Ole Miss, that just started, uh, uh, just announced the Narrative Intelligence uh, Center, working with the Department of Defense, the University of Arizona, and all that they uh, represent and, and their med school, law school, business school, land grant, engineering. But how do we have regional hubs that we can bring about stakeholders, not only here in DC within the industry, but in the heartland and, and middle America to tell the benefits and do the research and create the curriculum and the workforce training around AI so that we can truly lead globally, internationally in the competitive, competitiveness maximize the benefit, benefits, minimize the harms. And this panel kind of represents, you know, the thought leadership that we hope uh, that we can bring to the debate. Uh, the House, Senator Schumer has had a thoughtful group, a bipartisan group of members and industry coming in to begin the early discussions. Uh, Colin, it reminds me of the early work of the 1996 Act. How do you get everybody in a room to begin driving what you hope will eventually be a consensus of a policy framework. And so I'm gonna close with this. Any, any policy recommendations, principles, or any, what is the next cool, great application that you may have heard about or you may wanna tell the crowd is coming as it relates to AI? I'm gonna start with you, Sana, and then work our way back this way. Sounds good. I'll go first. So in terms of any policy initiatives that I think are going to be really important, I think first and foremost is going to be education and training. I think as we saw the wave of computer science being introduced in the K-12 curriculum, I think we're going to need to see a wave of AI training or some machine learning training to be brought into the cur curriculum as well. Like this is here to stay and it's growing. It's made such extensive progress in just the last couple of years. So that's really on the education side, but then on the training side with the workforce, not everybody needs to be an expert in AI, but what we're really working on doing, especially as we've been introducing all this new automation at, at Granite and all these new different machine learning applications is really teaching our teammates on how to leverage them. They don't need to be an expert on how it works in the back end of it all, but we can teach them all the cool things that it can do to put them in a better position to support our customers. So from a policy standpoint, I think it's really education and training is something that I'm really looking forward to seeing what the bipartisan committee comes out with and um, how that's really going to revolutionize uh, the newer generations. In my experience, um, you know, sort of successful legislation or successful regulation uh, has to go through three stages. First is an education stage. So understanding and appreciating what the technology brings, understanding how it works, understanding what you believe to be the implications. The second stage is uh, after educate is activate, where you activate supporters, people who feel similarly 
build coalitions. And then the third stage is to legislate or to regulate. But you can't short circuit the first two parts of the process and go directly to legislation. I think we need to take to heart uh, Milo's caution about the limits of government uh, in quote unquote solving uh, problems. Uh, but I feel we're very much in the education stage of this debate still, and we need to learn more. Uh, but we need to learn fast because the technology is advancing so rapidly. Uh, and I think uh, there's great promise uh, with uh, AI technologies, but there's also potential peril. Uh, and I think the more we learn and the more we, we uh, stress test each other's theories and presumptions, uh, the better off we'll be at the activate and legislate stage. So Chip, um, I think um, one of the things, I, I really have been thinking about this for a number of years. Uh, there is no institution of higher learning. Um, there is no um, government um, entity um, that is divorced or that cannot contribute to, to uh, the enhancement of education and training in this country. So that makes the opportunities boundless, uh, that uh, geographically and otherwise, um, there is no subject matter that cannot benefit you know, uh, can't be enhanced, cannot contribute to this uh, debate. So an AI-focused curriculum, no matter what your major is, no, no matter where you are, I think would be helpful in creating lifelong learning opportunities. That's important. Uh, we have to do so and approach these things ethically and responsibly. And again, uh, educational institutions and, and the like are uniquely, I think, uh, situated, um, you know, to help aid in that, to help educate when it comes to that, to help enhance that. Let's not forget data, privacy and security. Let's not uh, forget, in, um, you know, intellectual uh, property rights. Let's not forget the prospect of international collaboration, all of these things, antitrust, I can go on because I have the list here in red. Um, you know, all, all of these things are important, but let's not forget the power of public-private partnerships, and those P's are multiple, um, local, local, state, local, uh, you know, uh, national, and yes, international. Um, all of these things, I think, are, are have the, uh, the prospect of establishing the right type of balance when it comes to guardrails and other responsibilities, um, Milo. Uh, and um, it, it really, honestly, I, I think um, makes our future more bright. Thank you. Milo, I'm going to let you uh, close with a, the most insightful comment at the end. I don't know that I can get you that, but I do think one of the great opportunities before us is actually reforming uh, education and um, uh, higher ed. The thing that has consistently shown to raise kids' test scores and, and be effective in learning is one-on-one -on -one tutoring. And I think AI has the ability to potentially take that and make that available to a vast number of people and students uh, that can't afford to do it, can't afford to pay for that um, today. And I think that's going to be an incredible opportunity if our systems are able to handle that because um, that also challenges a number of structures and a number of uh, ways that we have uh, educated kids in the past. So I think there are some great opportunities there. Um, the one other thing I would just say is the rate of change in the technology is really increasing. If you think the level of change that you've seen today is high, there are huge amounts of capital flowing into not just the hardware, but also uh, companies who are building new applications and new uh, capabilities with the technology. And so um, it's not going to be stable for a very long time. And so the question is really about how can you take advantage of that uh, so that your business, your opportunity uh, can lever that in a way that is uh, effective for you. Uh, I, I do think there's a certain amount of fear uh, because this is not, AI is not coming for the job of the plumber or the electrician. It's coming for 
bringing new competition in the white collar, uh, in the administrative, in the knowledge worker game. And that really has not happened before. And so I think it's going to be really interesting to see how that shapes out. Well, as, as we close, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about the establishment, the creation of the, the center uh, with Encompass. I'm, I'm very excited that leaders like Milo and Mignon and, and Sana and Colin and others have agreed to be, serve on our advisory board. You know, our mission is to promote competition and innovation in technology and in networks. Um, we want to bring the benefits of those principles to all parts of the country. And just to close with one example in my home state of Mississippi, how I believe AI will, will have a broad benefit in states like mine and rural parts of the country. Uh, AWS just announced two major hyperscale data centers, somewhere between 10 to $16 billion of investments. It's modernizing all of the electricity uh, infrastructure of our state, multi-billion dollars will go into solar and wind and, and, and the power needed uh, for the data centers. And the data centers will primarily be uh, running large language models, correct, you know, improving AI applications in every sector. And that's in Jackson, Mississippi. And what we've seen where those data centers locate is it, it becomes like the equivalent of the old world port city it becomes the modern port city where commerce and education and research all co-locates around it and the distribution networks locate around it. And so that's in my home state. And so I'm very proud that we can do this with Encompass, that we can add to the debate. I think we're uniquely positioned and we have a defined core value that serves this mission well. So I'm. Um, I'm very proud to announce uh, today the creation of the, the AI Public Policy and Responsibility Center. And I'm very proud to have my friends on the, on, the, on, the, on the platform here to join us in that effort. So thank you all.